Good afternoon to you all. In a short while, I will be joined, and we will be joined, in fact, by the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean Pierre Lacroix, and the United Nations Police Advisor, Com um, Police Advisor Commissioner Faisal Shakhar. They will be here to brief you <coughs> on the uh, fourth United Nations Chiefs of Police Summit, which is otherwise known as UN COPS. There you go. Uh, that'll take place here at headquarters from t uh, today and tomorrow. Building on the momentum of recent peacekeeping ministerial meetings and other initiatives, the summit brings together more than 500 member states' representatives, including ministers and deputy ministers, chiefs of police, chiefs of gendarmerie, to all to reaffirm the importance of multilateralism in addressing complex global challenges. Uh, speaking of complex global challenges, we often talk about money here and the lack thereof. Uh, and our colleagues in the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tell us that halfway into 2024, since we're now at the end of June, just 18% of the $48.7 billion needed to help people in need around the world has been received. And that means out of $48.7 billion, we have $8.8 .8 billion in the bank only. This is less than the amount we had received in the same time last year. And as I think we've told you often and illustrated uh, with hard facts, these funding gaps have real consequences for the lives of millions of people, and we encourage donors to continue to contribute generously to our humanitarian response plans. Our humanitarian colleagues warn that the consequences of this underfunding have particularly acute uh, in the nine most underfunding crises, which are Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti, Honduras, Mali, Myanmar, and Sudan. Um, and at 1.15 p.m. this afternoon, uh, part of the Economic and Social Council's Humanitarian Affairs segment, there will be an event here in Conference Room 7 entitled Underfunding and the Cost of Inaction, How to Address One of the Main Challenges to Humanitarian Response. You can follow the event live on web TV. Uh, and in a statement we issued uh, last night, the Secretary General expressed his concern um, over the reported violence in Kenya connected to the protests and the street demonstrations. He is saddened by the reports of deaths and injuries, including of journalists and medical personnel. The Secretary General is also concerned at reported cases of targeted arbitrary detentions. He underscores the need to uphold the right to demonstrate peacefully, and he urges the Kenyan authorities to exercise restraint and call for all demonstrations to take place peacefully. The Secretary General conveys his condolences to the bereaved families and wishes those injured a speedy recovery. And just to illustrate the point I was making about underfunding in Sudan and the situation there, um, our humanitarian affairs colleagues tell us that we and our partners are working to scale up response efforts to address the deepening humanitarian crises in Darfur, in Khartoum, and other hotspots around Sudan. The situation in and around North Darfur's capital of El Fasha continues to be extremely worrying, with UNICEF saying that more than 400 children have reportedly been killed and maimed during the recent escalation in fighting in and around that city. The continued use of explosive weapons in populated areas is posing further risk to civilians and aid workers alike. Meanwhile, colleagues in the World Food Program report that the agencies have distributed critical emergency food and nutrition supplies for more than 135,000 people at Al Jazeera State in the east central part of Sudan. This is the first time that World Food Program supplies have gotten into Sudan's breadbasket since, since conflict spilled over to the state capital, Mad uh, Wad Madani, in December of last year. That forced World Food Program to temporarily relocate staff and its operations. Elsewhere, WFP convoy carrying more than 2,300 metric tons of food assistance for some 164,000 men, women, and children impacted by conflict is crossing the border from Chad into Darfur and on the road to north and central Darfur. Our UNICEF colleagues also warn that the situation is dire, particularly for children, some 14 million children, that's more than half of the 24 million children in Sudan are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. 
And just to re as a reminder that tomorrow we will be joined virtually by Ryan Paulson, the director of FAO's Office of Emergency Resilience, and Samer Abdel Jabber, the World Food Program's director of emergency, and with Lucia Elmi, UNICEF's director of emergency programs. She'll be here in person, and they will all be here to brief you on the latest integrated food security phase classification update on Sudan. That's the IPC on Sudan, uh, looking at the horrendous um, picture of hunger in that country. Um, and we will start off with the guests tomorrow, and I will follow them. Heading south to South Sudan, we continue to update you on the situation in uh, uh, Unity State and in neighboring Ruang administrative area following clashes that erupted over the weekend. Our peacekeeping colleagues tell us that peacekeepers were deployed in Manga Port in Unity region to prevent violence or retaliatory attacks. They tell us that the situation there is currently calm, though tensions remain high. The deployment of troops have been welcomed by local authorities. In addition, the peacekeeping uh, mission continues to um, send peacekeepers, patrols to hotspots across Unity and Ruang uh, states. Um, Turning to the Occupied Palestinian Territory, earlier today, our UN Humanitarian Coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Mohanad Hadi, led a, led a field visit to the West Bank to witness how settlement expansion and restrictions on access movements are fueling humanitarian needs. The mission, which was organized by OCHA and the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, included a visit to Tolkarim City and two adjacent camps, Tolkarim and Nur al-Shams. Mr. Hadi met with communities there who spoke on the impact of the recurrent operations by Israeli forces in the camps. Across the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Ocha says that as of Monday, 536 Palestinians, nearly a quarter of them children, have been killed since October 7th. The vast majority were killed by Israeli forces and at least 10 by Israeli settlers. Nearly 5,400 Palestinians were injured in these incidents. In the week between 18th and the 24th of June, Ocha, Ocha also documented 18 attacks by Israeli settlers across the West Bank, resulting in injuries and damage to Palestinian-owned properties. Um, and turning to Gaza, <coughs> Ocha tells us that insecurity and active hostilities in the South are still a major impediment to humanitarian operations. In the past week, a number of attacks have hit the periphery as, uh, of the Al-Mawasi area, where, as you know, many, many displaced people have uh, tried to seek shelter. One of the major and ongoing constraints in picking up supplies from the Karim Shalom crossing uh, remains uh, major, excuse me, remains a major obstacle. And to do that, humanitarian organizations have been confronted by criminal activity along the single road they've been forced to use amid Israeli operations, military operations nearby. The Israeli authorities continue to restrict the use of alternative roads. Meanwhile, partners are working to support health care in Gaza, warn that power blackouts, as we've been telling you, due to fuel shortages, continue to put lives of critically ill patients at risk. This includes newborn patients receiving dialysis and those in the intensive care wards of hospitals. The lack of fuel is also hampering efforts to respond to the water, sanitation, and hygiene crisis across the Strip. Partners working on the response say that water production from groundwater wells, which was the main source of this water supply, has shrunk by more than 50 percent from 35,000 cubic meters per day to just 15,000. And this morning, uh, Virginia Gamba, the Secretary General Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict, briefed the Security Council on the latest report uh, from the Secretary General on that very topic. She said that last year, UN verified an appalling 32,990 grave violations against 22,557 children in 25 countries and one regional situation covered by her mandate. Uh, the highest number of grave violations during the 2023 calendar year were found in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, including Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Somalia, Nigeria, and Sudan. Ms. Gamba underscored that cooperation, solidarity, and the political will to mitigate, stop, and ultimately end and to prevent violations against children is the only way forward. She asked Security Council members to push 
for peaceful resolutions of disputes while also protecting children when we fail to bring them peace. The Council also heard from our former Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, in his capacity as Deputy Chair of the Elders. He stressed that there should be no impunity for those who commit crimes against children anywhere in the world, whether uh, they be states or armed groups in autocracies or democracies. Two international days to flag for you, the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. In his message for the day, the Secretary General reminds us that breaking the cycle of suffering means starting at the beginning before drugs take hold by invent investing in prevention. <clears throat> and today is also the International Day in support of victims of torture. The day is a reminder that torture is a crime against humanity. And as the Secretary General said, torturers must never be allowed to get away with their crimes and systems that enable torture should be and that enable torture should be dismantled or transformed. Madame Letterer. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Steph. Um, first, on uh, the humanitarian um, figures that that you gave out, um, you said that um, the figures. This year, the, the money figures. The money yep. figures were less. The percentage was right, less than, than last, last year. year. Can we get some hard figures from of, last year? Some comparison from last figures? year yeah, for That's no for comparison. Yes, ma'am. Um, and what does the UN think that the main reasons are? Is it um, a lot of money going to Gaza and? before Gaza, Ukraine? Is it donor fatigue? I, listen, I, I think there is money in the world, right? It's just not getting to where it's needed. Uh, why governments and member states are giving less, they may also have, they have, member states have competing demands. Uh, a lot of member states have less money on hand than they, they, they used to have. Um, our traditional donors also have competing priorities. I also think there are member states uh, that do not have, that have not traditionally been donors, that could be donors. Um, it is also good to spread, um, uh, you know, for, I think for any business, if we want to look at it as a business, it's always a good idea to have a broader client base. Um, so we would encourage those member states who don't traditionally give to give, um, and we understand there are competing uh, demands, but we also, you know, it, it's also a reminder of the need to invest in prevention. When we talk about development, we talk about the SDGs, and we flag these things ahead. It is much less expensive to invest in sustainable development than it is to have to uh, pay for humanitarian operations. Second Hold on, your microphone's not, oh, there we go, go ahead. Um, on Gaza-related questions, is any UN aid at all using the um, road that Israel said it was going to halt fighting on from Kerem Sholom to the coast road? Um, is the UN moving any aid on that road? Well, I mean, the, one of the challenges we, we have, which I've just flagged, is that the road that we've been told to use to access Karim Shalom is now insecure for us because of increased criminal activity. So we have not been able to use that particular road. And is there any update on when the um, Department of Safety and Security review of the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, no, peers. No, uh, no update on the use of the peer to share with you. Michelle Van Deji. Thanks, Steph. Just a bit of a follow up to Edie's question then. Um, you know, when some of these convoys started getting stopped initially, mm -hmm. however long ago, and the UN was talking about self distribution. So, which, you know, you've explained that that's right, sort right. of desperate people right, who are starving right. and want the food. But now we've moved on now to, like, criminal activities. Right. So can you just explain to us a little bit about, you know, the, in, the intent of those people looting I, those I mean, trucks? I, I think there is a um, – listen, I, I'm not on the ground, but I think there's a clear difference between desperate people uh, getting to the supplies on a trucks – on trucks – and taking them. 
than armed men, and I would say they're probably only men, with guns taking material off a truck at gunpoint. That, to me, is the difference. That would be criminal activity. And that's the majority of what's happening That's now? That's the challenges that we have, one of the many challenges that we have in, in accessing uh, the Karim Abu Salam side of the Karim Shalom And are they crossing. taking this aid to resell at greater it's cost? Like, is it turning it, up in markets? I mean, I, I, you know, uh, it's, that, that's not something I can speak to. I don't think it's being exported, I can tell you that. Deji. Just a f quick follow-up also on this issue. You said it's increased criminal activity. Um, I know that UN has to abide by its neutrality mm. in conduct in those, in those operations. So UN is not able to ask Israel for facilitating those, to, to secure those convoys in Gaza Strip. Is that correct? We, yeah, we, we do not operate under the protection of, uh, of the Israeli army, right? We operate, and we want to operate under the protection of the community. So, uh, the, again, I mean, I, I, you know, we're, we're kind of meandering in, in, in different paths, but the, the, the road to success here is a ceasefire, is our ability to have uh, full and unimpeded humanitarian access, to see the immediate release of all uh, the hostages. We're just gnawing at the edges, right? Trying to get something done at great uh, at, at great risk. Yeah, uh, Steph. Let me let me put it simple, because everybody said in this podium that there is a collapse of social uh, order mm -hmm. in Gaza. Mm -hmm. That if that is the fact, so technically speaking, there's no one UN could rely on to deliver those humanitarian aid safely. Well, I mean, so, we do use local partner. I mean, it's, you know, there, there are local organizations that we use. But we're, we're op I mean, Deshi, we're, we're operating in the middle of a conflict zone. I know. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're not distributing aid in Andorra. I mean, let, let's face, I mean, it's, you know, we can use all sorts of, of, of comparisons. Um, so there's, <laughs> we're trying to do the best we can putting, you know, with, with our Palestinian colleagues putting themselves at risk, our international colleagues putting themselves at risk, um, trying to help people who are desperately trying to, uh, to survive. We want the fighting to stop. So from the UN, the only way out now is a ceasefire to... I mean, they, they are, obviously, we, we've put, as I said yesterday, there are a number of things we want from the... From the from the Israeli Defense Forces. It's not as if we're sitting on our hands until we get a ceasefire. And I think that should be pretty clear by now because we've talked about it every day. But the best path forward is exactly that. Uh, Dulce. Uh, so speaking of the uh, demands by the UN to Israel, what is the status of, of that uh, discussion? Uh, nothing to... Um, Nothing great to report at this point. It is, so the WFP is still not uh, offloading aid from That's the correct. U.S. pier. That's correct. And so all that aid is still sitting there at the pier. We're, we're just not, yeah, we're, we, we, I mean, whether others or other non-UN organizations are taking it, that's a question for, uh, for others to answer. But UN, we are, as UN, are not picking, are, do not have the environment that we need to pick up that aid yet. So just one more question. If you don't get any of your demands met by the Israelis, um, what are the chances actually of your, uh, the UN pulling out of Gaza? We're, we're not pulling out of Gaza. We're not going to, 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 we're not pulling out of Gaza. We are trying to, to operate in a space that more often than not is shrinking. When it expands, we take that opportunity. Uh, we're just trying to, it's like, a, we're, we're just trying to find the space in which we operate within conditions that, uh, that meet the, our very basic and pretty simple standards. Yes, sir. Thank you, Steph. Greg Walton, AFP. Um, can I touch on Kenya? Um, has there been any conversation between the SG and his team and any of the representatives of the Kenyan police, maybe here for UN COPS, about the violence in Kenya, uh, or indeed about the deployment in Haiti? 
Uh, on the deployment in Haiti, uh, that is not being done as, as a UN-sponsored, uh, I mean, as, as a peacekeeping operation, as you, as you know. And, um, right now, we, I think, our, our colleagues, uh, the UN offices in Nairobi, uh, have repeated the messages that we've said uh, publicly, uh, and we continue to follow the situation. Okay. Michelle Nichols. <laughs> Um, it's a, yeah, I was going to ask. Moderator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry. I, yes. I, I'm deferring to AFP because they just stole my question. Uh, <laughs> I did, question. Had you raised your hand? Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. So he, the SG expressed uh, concern yeah. yesterday. We're seeing reports that some 23 people at least have been yeah. killed. Is that concern going to become condemnation? Uh, listen, we. Any time you see lethal use of force uh, by the police by security forces, we would want to see a clear accountability, investigations. Uh, and and, and we, we have no doubt that the, the Kenyan justice system uh, will deliver uh, on that. It's, a, it's, an, it's an issue of accountability that is needed. Michelle. Sorry, just back to Gaza. Um, do you have anything on uh, Israel's apparently going to increase or set up the electricity a little, supply. A little closer, you know. Sorry, the electricity supply for a desalination plant in Khan Yunus. Uh, I um, hadn't seen that, but I will. You clearly have. I have not, but I will look. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Johan Ashleman from Switzerland, Watson. Just a Ukraine question. Um, is the UN in any way involved in a follow-up to the peace conference in Switzerland or in any other attempt to bring about some, some diplomatic effort to solve the conflict? Thank you. We, we, were, uh, we were not part of the formal process of the, uh, of the conference in, uh, in Switzerland. We were there as observers. Uh, we remain in touch uh, with the parties and uh, available uh, for any efforts. Uh, what we want to see is an end to this conflict in line with international law and General Assembly resolutions and the, full, and the territorial integrity of Ukraine. On that note, I will go get our guests and uh, please stand by. <laughs> <laughs>